The COVID pandemic has seen a sharp collapse in trade volume, especially cross-border trade investment and commodity prices have negatively impacted the forecast for Africa's economic growth. For the first time in 25 years, GDP for the continent is projected to contract. Comparative value chain analysis shows some similarities. Adoption includes shifting manufacturing towards the production of personal protection equipment. There's a renewed focus on boosting intra-regional trade in the pharmaceutical sector. COVID-19 has strengthened the case for developing African regional value chains and unlocking the continent's business potential through the African continental free trade area. Uganda's foreign direct investments have also significantly dropped, marked by a departure of a number of multinational firms recently. To discuss this subject of investment, we have a panel of three, including Abeka Mayanja, a financial economist. We have John Walugembe Kakungulu, who is, from, who is the executive director of the Federation for Small and Medium Enterprises. And lastly, but not least, we have Paul Lokuma, Lakuma from the Economic Policy Research Center. Good evening, this is Citizen Voices, and I'm your host, Emmanuel Mutaiziwa. Uh, first things first, uh, Abeka, thank you so much for having you. I know you've taken, uh, you've been on the road, but you've managed to come through. We, we had a bit of delay, but we'll be able to compensate uh, for those who are watching us out there. Uganda recently, uh, before we had uh, the economy being roiled by COVID and all these challenges that have, you know, uh, come to pass, we registered an unprecedented growth in terms of foreign direct investment in 2019, an increment from a figure of 211 million US dollars inflows up to 1.3 billion dollars. Uh, perhaps that could have been pegged towards uh, investments in the oil and gas sector. Um, what do you, did you attribute that exponential growth to? And um, before we come to discuss the issues, uh, definitely in regard to what COVID then has definitely uh, reduced FDIs, but what, is, what do you think prompted that expo exponential growth in 2019? Yeah, the, the new sector that we have in the economy is uh, the oil and gas sector. And for quite some time, uh, there was a bit of an effort to improve the investment climate and Uganda's uh, performance in the investment climate and uh, World Bank doing business survey started to improve. But the main driver of an exponential increase in investment was the oil and gas sector. Then also, when you look at uh, the, 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 the current figures, it has dropped a little bit, um, mainly because of the political business cycle, which kind of works in reverse. Well, as another factor that could explain the increment is that, you know, investment is made of both, you know, public and private investment. So towards elections, we tend to invest a bit more, and that complements the private sector investment. Uh, that drop can be explained by the COVID, but also the reverse that investors tend to become shy towards our election. And that explains the exponential growth then the, the sudden drop in 2020 on top of COVID. And the other matter that I've heard is related to um, the tax, the tax, taxing of capital, capital gains tax, mm -hmm. especially for companies like private equity firms that focus more on portfolio related investment. I think those are some of the factors that I can attribute to the exponential increment and then the, rec the receding of that uh, trajectory. Thank you. Mr. Alugembe, uh, our FDIs have since dropped significantly yes. to about roughly 800 million US dollars. Correct. And the average in the region and that's, I think, a, sh a, a decline by 38%. Mm. And um, the average in the East African region is about 16%. Mm. Perhaps does that feed into what Mr. Mayanja is saying, that towards the election cycle, mm. uh, investors are likely going to 
you know, keep away. If I can take my money to Seychelles, why should I bring it to Uganda where there are lots of risk factors, where there are riots, where there are all these kind of things. But there's also been an issue in regard to the oil sector, uh, the final investment decision, the delays that uh, I think, uh, and I, I can't recall the name of the organization that published a paper. And um, if uh, largely anchored on the fact that as we move towards um, the shift towards renewable energy, then our oil resource, uh, coupled with all these kind of delays, then our oil resource is, is losing value. And the estimate was, I think, placed at about $50 billion. I, perhaps it's, it's exaggerated. But what explains that sudden drop in terms of F FDIs? I would say that uh, the biggest impact, in my opinion, is COVID-19. Um, most of the parent companies in wherever they are situated have been grappling with a lot of issues back home. So most of them have had to withdraw their capital uh, back into their domestic market. So for me, that would be the primary driver of this change. Uh, definitely elections and the uncertainty around elections would be an issue. But in this particular case, because there wasn't a lot of uh, physical campaigning and so on, it would not uh, have played uh, a significant role. And as you've mentioned, the world is moving towards uh, renewable energy. A lot of investors are exiting from fossil fuels. Uh, so for instance, uh, Harvard University has exited from all its fossil related investments. And there is a lot of pressure on all kinds of companies uh, the Norwegians have done the same. The Sovereign Fund is one of the biggest investors, especially through private equity on this continent. So that move away from fossil fuels does not go well for our oil and gas sector, particularly when we are taking our time to sign the investment decision as happened here. Yes. Uh, Paul, uh, to bring you in, the issue of um, uh, this, the, the usual cycle of riots Mm -hmm. The issue of endemic corruption, the, the growth in terms of um, the rise of the sovereign debt. When do we have a candid conversation and look at a way of addressing these issues? If the if 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 so that this can translate to better foreign direct investments. Well, uh, what I would say, um, the issues are being addressed. Uh, because uh, it's not an issue you could you could address as an individual. It's an institutional issue. It's a, it's a, a thing which you uh, address through institutions. Uh, uh, some of them are constitutional offices, such as the office of the IGG, uh, parliament, uh, auditor general. There are there are issues which will uh, take time for the growth of those institutions to have uh, power, both formally and informally. Um, but that said, um, I think um, with corruption uh, withstanding, uh, notwithstanding, uh, I think I would agree uh, with my two colleagues that uh, COVID-19 uh, affected uh, uh, foreign direct investments uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, foreign direct investors had to adapt to the new normal and had to play it safe. Uh, and so uh, they would rather keep cash and, uh, and the, some of their resources in banks. If you check the banks right now, globally, even here in Uganda, banks have a lot of money during the COVID-19 period uh, because of the, uh, of the caution, of the abundance of caution they had to play into the market. But um, I would like to say there are historical things also which, uh, 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 which play into FDI, especially why Uganda would attract uh, FDI. Uh, one of them is uh, an open capital account, which allows uh, repatriation of profit that attracts uh, FDI. And uh, also, uh, why would uh, uh, the loss of FDI uh, be at a faster rate than the loss in East Africa. You said uh, 30 something compared to 16 percent. Of course, so we have competitors in the region. 
the more we try to make ourselves attractive for investors, other countries are also doing it. Rwanda is doing it, Kenya is doing it. So it depends on who does it better. But there are, there are issues where investors would come, even if you didn't uh, adjust them significantly. Issues like taxation. Uh, I don't think a lot of investors care so much about taxation. They care about the other issues, the infrastructure, uh, the bribery, um, how quickly things can be done. Uh, I think tax lies lower uh, in, the, in the ranking of the issues they look at. Uh, Mr. Abu, I think sometimes to be able to attract FDIs is quite a balancing act. The issue of capital gains tax is quite um, a kind of bottleneck. Um, but equally, is the, then there's also the issue of um, uh, the tax holidays. Who do you give uh, these tax holidays to? Um, we have a habit of cherry picking some of these companies, and, you, and you, you, the tax body loses a lot of revenue as a result. Where is how can we strike a balance to ensure that we have the companies, multinationals coming in here and finding a good climate for investment? but also ensure that we don't lose lots of revenues, for, for instance, through uh, these tax holidays that we grant and all this kind of the, the land that we give away to investors free of charge. And sometimes it turns out that these are briefcase companies uh, that we didn't do enough due diligence. So uh, one of the things that uh, could explain also somewhat that growth is like I was trying to explain, th there are two types of foreign direct investment. There is the green field, where they actually set up a factory. And then there is the portfolio FDI, which comes of two types. Sometimes they're investing in, in paper assets, like bonds and shares. And so with the advent, uh, or the growth of the private equity firms in East Africa, has contributed, there are a few examples of companies that have attracted FDI, um, like for example, being Zika Farmers mm -hmm. um, attracted FDI, and so through portfolio investment in form of equity. And why is this important? You see, the, the COVID has impacted a lot on the SMEs, mm -hmm. and some of the nature of the investors we have nowadays is they are of a financial nature, financial portfolio investors. And they are complaining that the, 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 the ground is not leveled. That's why private equity investments in Kenya are probably 10 times what they are. So while on the other hand, uh, there was a lot of effort in the setup of industrial parks, to agree with Paul, for facilitation, not necessarily free, but of course when you, an investor came, then you know they could go to Namanve and they could be allocated a piece of land and then they could develop their factory. That's one trend. But when it comes to portfolio investors are uh, looking for a sizable company uh, that is generating good revenues and can attract a certain size of capital because uh, below a certain amount of capital, it doesn't make investment sense. So we really need to think afresh in terms of the policy, especially for portfolio investors, because it's directly impacting the capital flow in terms of FDI as one of the factors. Then secondly, um, when it comes to new things that have been done by the government to attract investments, we now have the, the Free Zones Authority and the Law for Free Zones. And we think that that will stimulate more FDI in terms of uh, companies that are looking to export and they can get incentives. So these incentives, while in the past used to be given out in a way that was not transparent, I think it's safe to say that we have seen a lot of improvement. Things have been streamlined. The, you know, if you put your factory here, this is what you get. So we've been hearing less and less of uh, controversies that are related to, you know, incentives that have been given ad hoc. In fact, we are getting the opposite now, that for people in the communication sector, they're having to pay quite a bit for their licenses. And so we are now getting the opposite. So the issue of 
incentives that are not given in a systematic way, I would like to say has reduced. They are now set in the Free Zones Act if you locate somewhere or if you are in an exporter and you're manufacturing and selling more than 80% of your output out of the country, you automatically benefit from a 10-year tax holiday. So there's an improvement in that area. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Walugembe, the multinational firms, mm. especially in areas like telecom mm. and oil and gas, have quite a lot of clout mm. and leverage. Mm. As you are aware, in this country, mm. they have found smart ways to, you know, evade, uh, avoid, avoid uh, paying taxes mm. uh, through DT, double taxation agreements and all these kind of things. Mm. But that environment is sustained as a result of endemic corruption. In this country, we have nearly certified people who are known as commission agents, yes. and they've created mm. chaos. Um, do you think that um, the new po changes, uh, the one-stop uh, center at U Uganda Investment Authority, mm. could reduce a lot of this bureaucratic red tape and uh, we get to a situation where we can el eliminate this habit where an investor comes, he's genuine, he wants to you know, put his dollars or euros or pounds into the economy, and someone is asking for a bribe to take them to a high authority. Mm. Why can't we centralize these things? Why can't we borrow from our neighbors? I won't mention okay. doing these kind of things. I want to be very blunt. Uganda is doing very badly in terms of attracting foreign direct investment. This is the truth. We are, we are doing badly. And uh, when an investor wants to come here, he looks at a number of issues, and mm -hmm. the World Bank has, unfortunately, this week the World Bank stopped that study because of corruption. It had those corruption not just in Uganda, but somehow infiltrated the World Bank to the extent that there was there such a doctrine that doing business report. However, investors looked at that report as a, a cue as to how conducive the environment in which they intend to invest in is. And Uganda has been consistently doing very badly on that score. Mm. The last score we had was 116 out of 190 economies. So that's the starting point. Yes. Let us have an environment that is predictable, that is clear, that is devoid of corruption. Let's have commercial courts that can resolve disputes. Let's have, a pro if I want one square mile of land and I'm not Akon, how do I access it? All those things need to be resolved. Um, so that's one. Second, when we look at the figures, FDI into Africa is concentrated into a few resource-rich countries or a few large economies. These poor countries like ours are really struggling to attract uh, credible FDI. And as you've mentioned, the figures went up in 2019. Why? Because of oil and gas. So. My view, therefore, is let's improve the business environment, let's eliminate all forms of corruption and all kinds of uh, guys, who, commission agents who are trying to make money off investors. And I think the one-stop shop is a step in the right direction. It's not yet there yet. People speak as if it's <laughs> working as it should. It's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And we need to be honest about it. You, all these entities, yes, they have... Um, all these entities have a representative at UIA, but those are very low-level staff. I cannot, the, the, new, the new leadership at UIA is doing its best and we want to applaud them. But let's support them. Let's not assume that they've achieved because there's a lot to do. Now, the other issue is we cannot rely on FDI alone. We have to prioritize domestic investment. It has been shown that more jobs are created through domestic investment than the other way around. Mm. In any case, FDI and domestic investment are linked because investors need to work with credible local firms. And part of the problem here is that some firms come here and they don't have strong local players with whom to partner. So in my view, A, let's improve the business environment. Let's eliminate corruption. Let's eliminate all kinds of things. Let's have a working one-stop shop which is empowered, at the moment it's not empowered, you know. Then, and then some of the requirements that are being asked for, business plan, this, this, no, let's, let's make, let's simplify the process. And then finally, let's 
um, put her efforts into building a local or domestic um, investment base. It's very important, especially now. Paul, well, uh, what John say, John Walugembe says is quite uh, critical here. Mm -hmm. That many times we try to prop up the multinationals and ignore the local domestic players. And yet, mm -hmm. sh we should have some. It should have. We should have a bit of tandem that mm -hmm. the local players also benefit from uh, the, the foreign investments. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that really during the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, the local farms, you know, have, you know, been placed in a, in a chokehold mm -hmm. that many of them have collapsed, many of them have debt, many of them have lost their assets as a result of foreclosure. How can we ensure that whereas we attract foreign investment, we also think about the local entrepreneur who is paying a very high tariff for electricity, who is competing against so many odds to stay alive? Yeah, uh, apart from improving the business environment, uh, infrastructure, um, taxation, taxation, uh, as uh, John Walugembe said, there have been steps uh, heralded by the medium term revenue strategy, which is now trying to stabilize the tax law and make it more predictable uh, than in the past where there were a lot of discretionary um, uh, changes and uh, uh, where the minister had uh, minister of finance had uh, a bit of arbitrary power to offer incentives or offer exemptions uh, some of those uh, uh, details have been dealt with now taxation the rules are set for five years unless there's uh, of course there are escape clauses unless there's an emergency like COVID, which requires uh, some adjustment. Um, but uh, going to supporting uh, local investors, one, um, culture, uh, uh, the culture of uh, forming a corporate structure. A lot of our businesses are family businesses. And I want to uh, commend uh, Mayanja for mentioning how private equity is having uh, problems. One is, uh, uh, transparency with these companies with family business it's only known to family members mm. uh, a lot of our businesses cannot uh, uh, look for financing for external financing uh, outside commercial bank or family member or a friend uh, because uh, of issues of transparency which are required uh, for one to go for initial public offers or to even attract a private, a private uh, equity venture capitalist for you for them to invest in you yeah there are a lot of people there are a lot of uh, um, rich men and rich investors out there looking for opportunities and they are looking for these small businesses to invest in because they they are the future uh, innovations come from where you would think it would be the most unlikely uh, companies like Facebook, uh, you remember, they came from uh, garages. So we have such people with such ideas here. The only difference is um, the culture of, uh, of formalization. A lot of our things tend to remain uh, uh, informal. And uh, with such ground uh, for, 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 for play, an investor would, uh, would fear to invest in such a company because uh, of of events of a, a dispute. How do we resolve disputes? Uh, and I want to commend uh, Mayanja again for mentioning um, uh, the, the issue of uh, commercial courts and how quickly they should uh, resolve the backlog of cases. That, that also helps in creating confidence in th into the market and, uh, and attracting investors who would invest uh, in the small businesses we have in Uganda. Uh, it should not stop uh, with uh, uh, industrial parks alone. Industrial parks alone will not resolve the issue. Other things, uh, cultural issues, have to be dealt with. Yep. There's so much hope that is being pegged on the African continent of free trade area. Um, as people think this is the kind of magic wand that is going to move us from um, 
the COVID pandemic and eventually it will become an endemic according to the scientists and we have to live with it and uh, make sure we inoculate our population and then in your view what needs to be done we can have this continental free trade zone but how do we get it working so it's very good that you talked about trade and uh, the africa free continental you know free trade area there was a blair commission that examined the impact of aid on african economies for the last 50 years mm -hmm. and found trade sorry found aid not to have managed to help us transform into developed economies. So there was an argument that we need to switch to trade. Now traditionally we've been trading with countries very far off um, in Europe, the US, the big economies of course, the large economies of the world. However, it is now becoming more apparent that to transform we need to do something different and so it's important to trade with Egypt, it's important to trade with Nigeria, it's important to trade with Kenya, with Sudan. Now the free trade area is meant to reduce the costs and the barriers related to doing business across borders. And by nature that means it will reduce the cost of the goods and by implication the demand would rise and that would create faster growth and incomes. So that's, that's the theory. But coming to now, um, when it comes to domestic direct investment, which uh, Mr. Walugembe talked about, it's important to understand that right now SMEs are on their knees. Uh, when you see multinationals closing, they were impacted twice. One, declining demand domestically because of incomes and people are out of a job. And then we've had a crisis in the logistics sector related to the prices of uh, moving a container from one place to another. So some companies, especially retailers, have been hit by what you call a twin crisis of, on the one hand, having very high transportation costs and on the other, low demand. And that combination, last year, the government came up with some policies that allowed pairs you earn to be deferred for three months and then the, the, the central bank was also very proactive in terms of restructuring of loans. I think that now uh, those kinds of measures that would add to liquidity in the economy would be warranted. Uh, another phenomenon that is interesting is when it comes to the digital economy, which is driving exponential growth in most economies and is absorbing youth. And uh, the, the, the fiscal policy right now does not seem to favor it. Uh, when you see attacks on data, yeah. um, which right now you think would not have been wise because... So what does technology do? Technology enhances the efficiency of existing businesses. And like we said, when companies are looking to invest here, they need local partners. They can't just fly in. Local partners need have to have grown to a certain level. So I have seen countries that have a tiered tax system, whereby if you're compliant and you reach a level of say $100,000 or 400 million Uganda shillings in turnover, then you get an automatic tax break for maybe three or four years. Then that allows you to build up the capital and employ more people. So what we need to do now as we wait for the continental area to manifest is to look very carefully at what can enhance the capacity of an SME. How can we put money back in the, in the pocket of an SME? Because that SME is the future attraction for FDI. Thank you. Mr. Walugembe, you work closely with SMEs, Correct. and there's a category, mm. largely the Ugandan economy, the mm. Chikubo economy, the informal economy, mm. and there are groups, associations, loosely, mm. you know, they've come together, mm. but they lack this expertise, they mm. lack this mm. uh, finesse yes. to form, to become SMEs. Correct. And we have a very big group of blue collar workers in, the, in that section. Mm -hmm. How can we formalize mm -hmm. um, that group to move, to shift mm -hmm. 
to the sustainable levels of SMEs that can withstand all these kind of shocks uh, going forward. Okay. So, first of all, I'll, before I tackle that, I just wanted to make a small thing on the African continent of free trade area. I think it's a good thing if we trade with each other. We trade more with outsiders than internally, as Abu has said, particularly with China and Southeast Asia. Africa has become a big supermarket for Chinese products, which is a good thing, but also a negative thing in terms of job creation. So any initiative that seeks to promote intra-African trade is good. When we're talking about the African trade, free trade area, we need to think about SMEs. Africa is an SME economy. And what has happened is that most SMEs are not even aware that this thing exists. Those that are aware are worried about the potential for competition from other economies. So this is a positive thing, but also a negative thing. We need to prepare. We need to ensure that our SMEs have the capacity to compete. And that's where the issue of formalization comes in. Formalization is extremely important because if you're talking about foreign direct investment, we cannot promote what we call backward and forward linkages if we don't have strong domestic firms. Very, very important. But registration and formalization need to be also incentivized. In this country, there is no incentive for formalizing. I can register, yes, I can pay taxes, yes, but what's the difference? Some people are thriving more, like you said, the Chikubo economy. Some of those people are even richer than the formal businesses. The formal businesses are struggling. Pay as you earn, this, that, NSSF, National Medical What, Simanya Standards, all kinds of a huge regulatory burden that is making it difficult for people to run formal enterprises. So what incentive are we giving, really? What incentive are we giving businesses to formalize? So as we, and I'm happy that in the new budget strategy, the minister says this year we'll focus on compliance and we, won't, we, do, we wouldn't want to introduce new taxes. Excellent. However, this compliance needs to be linked to particular benefits and incentives. And I would want to recommend two things. One, public procurement. When it comes to payment of taxes, SMEs are good. We should bring them in the tax bracket. When it comes to accessing public procurement, our SMEs don't have capacity. How come they have capacity to pay tax, but they don't have capacity to take advantage of the procurement mm. opportunities? So these two things, in my view, ought to be linked going forward. Finally, I want to say this issue of digitalization is very, very important. This tax on data needs to be scrapped mm. through a directive. We don't even need to go to parliament. The president can invoke his emergency powers and say mm. this tax is mm. scrapped because it's really wasting our time and it's going to bring more harm than good, particularly for our young people who are likely to thrive in the digital economy in this COVID-19 season. Paul, uh, the Investment Code Act of 2019 mm -hmm. presents challenges and opportunities uh, in regard to the subject of FDI. It places restrictions <coughs> on the transfer of te technology and expatriating profits, which, which is, I guess, a good thing for an economy like ours, but also grants uh, tax waivers uh, to these FDIs. It also sets a limit of I think 250,000 US dollars for advance for an FDI. Where do you think, how can we ensure that this works out perfectly well? I, I, I think when we're making laws uh, or legislation or regulation, we need to check consistency with other regulations. Uh, like you said, uh, there's a restriction on repatriation. Of profits, yes. And that is a contradiction because uh, our monetary policy, they, there's something they call the... Actually now even the, t the firms are required, I yeah. think the telecom firms are required now to invest on the uh, yeah, know, local uh, stock exchange. Because there's, there's something called the impossible trinity, where if you, um, uh, if, if you target inflation, then you must keep your capital account open. It's just something natural. It's just a law of physics that if you close your capital account and you're targeting inflation, they will counteract each other. The policy will be contradictory. And I think this, 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 this is a part of the policy which will be contradictory because we don't print money. Uh, we, don't, we don't create money anymore. 
uh, we abandon that policy. We more do uh, inflation targeting policy. And uh, we have a, a managed foreign exchange rate uh, system uh, where we manage the, the, the fluctuations. We don't manage the long run trend. Uh, and then we have an open uh, capital account. So I think there will be a contradiction if we reach. I'm, I'm not against it, it's a good policy, but it will be a contradiction of monetary policy. And then there will be friction uh, somewhere, and you see inflation rising and uh, you'd wonder where it's coming from. It's because of the, the, the things you're doing on the structural side or the fiscal side, and they are not consistent with your know, monetary policy. So I would urge the policy makers to look at that again. Uh, that said, um, the requirement for um, uh, telecoms to, to divest 20% or to issue uh, an initial public offer, so that uh, we have ownership of the company. That's a good step uh, because uh, it ensures sustainability of these companies because now we have a stake. Uh, these companies are now 20% Ugandan. However, um, uh, a lot of these initial public offers are usually uh, oversubscribed. And uh, the principle is everybody must have, a, anybody who comes before the deadline must have a, uh, uh, a share of 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 of, of, the, of the of 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 the shares being sold. So um, I don't know if you have noticed the the speed of trading at the Uganda Securities Exchange. I don't know it's something of uh, which will take time to mature, but sometimes I notice uh, the, the the trading there is quite sluggish. So there are some fundamental structural issues. Yeah. We need to ensure that we generate more money. This, I think this week you are a celebrated that day as. If as a commissioner general I would not celebrate now, I would postpone it until this difficult season passes. Yes, that day has come now, but for instance, if I have a wedding but we have lost a relative, I can say, let the wedding take place on Monday next week. We are in a difficult situation where uh, the tax base is being shaken. Multinationals are exiting, businesses have been hit hard. We don't really know what to do at this point. So I think focus should be again on SMEs, formalization, building a strong domestic entrepreneurship base that can contribute and pay taxes. And our taxes should be fair. They shouldn't be retrogressive. At this point, if someone, if I register my company, I get a TIN number and so on, there are all these things, local service tax, this, this. Can we have a streamlined tax code? I want to pay one million, and then I'm not being called the rest of the year. See? So for me, that is where the focus should be. Unfortunately, in the medium term, I see us borrowing more. Unfortunately, in the medium term, I see us borrowing more from the domestic market, which will crowd out Commercial banks, yes. Commercial banks. The commercial banks are happy because when you borrow from government, government is going to remain a going concern. Mm -hmm. If you lend to an SME, Walugembe Limited, yeah. you go to Nankulabe where his business was, he has disappeared. You call his phone, his phone is off. But when you lend to government, you know where the PSST sits, you know where the state house is. So for commercial banks, this is an, it's a no-brainer. They are happy to lend to government. But in the long term, it's going to squeeze uh, local businesses. Paul, as we come towards the end of this, yeah. we seem to be edging towards a fiscal cliff, and we, but we continue to borrow. Mm -hmm. And we seem to be spending a lot of this money, our, our recurrent expenditure, to sustain a bloated government. Mm -hmm. Members of parliament, we have one of the highest numbers uh, in the world, but when you look at the value that comes out of that, it's contested whether it's uh, value for money. When you look at RDCs and all these kind of people, why can't we put this money? Why do we borrow and then we spend in the less productive sectors of the economy? Yeah, uh, I think that has been the um, major argument, uh, especially from the civil society organizations and uh, think tanks uh, that are now the 
there has to be a shift. That borrowing is not bad, but uh, what do we use this money for? So we need to use this money for productive uh, sectors, uh, particularly uh, not limited to uh, infrastructure. Also, the uh, spending of the 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 front loading of infrastructure has also, in a way, been uh, disadvantageous, especially to vulnerable groups, women and youth. And also issues of uh, climate change are coming up uh, because uh, these um, uh, infrastructures, some of them um, have uh, an impact on environment. But, but, but that said, uh, I think debt need to be the governance around debt. What do we use this uh, debt for? Uh, uh, do we use it for uh, um, beneficial things, things which would benefit especially uh, vulnerable groups, the MSMEs, which are mostly manned by women and uh, youth? You know, 70% of the population is youth. So um, that's where uh, the debate needs to go. Uh, the, 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 the utilization and the absorption of debt. Sometimes even I've heard that uh, uh, we borrow when we, uh, we have not done the feasibility studies, so the money is there. Uh, and uh, we don't know what to As use it speak, for. As we speak now, we're paying about, I think, 25% of our entire collection to service interest yeah. every, every month. Yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, and, and Actually, that, that value, I think it uh, goes to 95% of revenue. If you look at it annually, uh, or about, uh, or about, uh, um, about 11 or 12% of GDP. So um, if we are going to pay such an amount, we have to get value for that money so that we don't um, transfer this burden to the next generation. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, our dear viewers, we're coming to the end of this uh, uh, program. We've been debating uh, the subject of investments and how to, you know, we can use investments to revive a battered economy. Uh, we know how uh, the COVID pandemic has uh, roiled the economy. We've been having a panel of three. Uh, Abeka Mayanja, who is a financial economist, Mr. Walugembe from the SMEs sector, and Paul Lakuma from Economic Policy Research Center. I've been your host, Emmanuel Mutaizewa, and have a pleasant evening. Thank you.